All right, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Josh Peterson. I'm, I'm the new environmental services manager for the for the city of Sioux Falls, and I'll be moderating today. So I'm here to introduce John Parker. He's uh, with the Minneapolis Conservation District. Started there in 2008 as a field specialist and became the manager in 2012. He's as the manager, he's tasked with overseeing many services the MCD provides, such as being responsible for planning approximately 1,000 acres of native grasses per year through its various projects. He's an alumni of UW Madison and has a strong science background in addition to his ex extensive experience surrounding planning, buffers, terraces, shelter belt design. His presentation will focus on providing a closer look at native grasses, analyzing numerous, numerous benefits and more. So, John, take it away. Thanks. Thanks for showing up. Hopefully, get something out and some informative stuff in that. Um, a couple things to think about as we're going through native grasses and the importance in the buffer. Um, school season and warm season grasses. We'll address a little bit of it here. I, there's a handout. If you didn't get one, I've got a couple left. Um, I'll get them to you. Um, and that, and then we'll talk. And a couple other things is to think about the types of grasses you're used to hearing about. And a couple guys already mentioned and you know, bluegrass, Kentucky blue, some of that kind of stuff. And I kind of frown, but that's in a different setting. This is in all the mother nature and stuff like that. So as we go through um, the importance of it. So, and as you can see the soil profile right here, and you can start to see the roots, how far they're going down. And, and some pretty next few slides, I'll show you some other ones. So you can get a feel of how the depth of the native grasses, whether they're warm or cool season, inhibits the ground and creates that buffer support to slow the water down, the infiltration in the ground. And uh, along with riparian areas, younger plants will make a bigger difference for you compared to a bunch of old trees. The younger ones do better, so it's it's good to keep things trimmed up and keep them growing, keep them invigorated. So we'll move on to the next slide. So native grasses, a lot of the talk in the last few years and stuff has been the Try to get to reestablish the native prairie of the area. And we're in a grasslands area here, and it goes on into Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and parts out in farther in. Warm and cold season grasses, they provide many benefits higher water quality, uh, pollution reduction, sediment dissolved pollutants, uh, reduce the soil erosion, or low maintenance once you get them started. Um, it can take two to three years to get a nice clean. And some mechanical stuff, you could use chemicals, but that kind of defeats the purpose of them being over the top of aquifers and stuff like that. So, um, they're good, good for wildlife assistance, food, shelter, and nesting. And over here is this, some, this is big blue stem. This is switchgrass. This is little blue. So, it gives you a quick picture on them. Uh, warm season, and in that pamphlet, you'll notice that there's a or that handout, there's a warm season, growing season, and a cool season. So uh, they grow during the summer months. Um, when the temp soil temps start to get about 60 degrees, they'll start kicking in. Um, they're stiffer stem than like bluegrass or what you normally name to. Something that's going to hold up, they're drought and soil tolerant. So if you have salty soils, they'll grow in that. If you go to wheat grasses, switch over to big blue, there's just various kinds. Um, most of the time, they don't form a blanket. They'll be bunch grass. They'll grow up in small clumps, and then they expand from there. Warm season examples, switchgrass, buffalo grass, blue and side oats grama, uh, Indian grass, big blue stem, the little blue stem, and there's many more. But those are kind of the top priority on the list of areas. Cool season. They grow during the spring and fall months. So to think of it like a bell-shaped curve, you go up, you come back down. Cool season grows on both ends of it. The warm season grows in the middle. And again, in that pamphlet, it'll tell you that the cool season will start growing in the middle of April, normal years, and go to about the middle of May, and then into the first part of June. Then it starts to get warm and dry, and it goes, takes off, or tapers off. Then the natives, the warm seasons, Will kick in, they'll grow from then to about the middle of August, 
And then about from the middle of August till frost, the warm seasons will be done. Cool season will kick back again. <clears throat> so part of the big thing that when you when you're creating buffers on the riverside or any place is, is that you got that competition of two seasons against one. So you have to do some mechanical means of controlling it or animal meat, <clears throat> and then be cows or cattle um, feeding on it, feed it to a certain height, you know, six to 12 inches, get them out of there, let it grow a little more. But the problem is, is that if you graze it too short, the warm seasons, they won't come back that year. Okay. They will kick in, they will, they will just lay dormant. So then your brown grass, your bluegrass, and all your cool seasons, they get a chance to grow. They go dormant, the warm season go dormant, then in the fall, the cool season kick in. So you got two, two against one. And that's why sometimes it's hard to get the native grasses established. And if you don't do either mowing, burning, or a animal type to control it, it's it's tough to get it established. And then some people get discouraged um, at the district. Patience is a big thing, but tell people if it looks bad the first year, that's what you want because you'll have a sprig growing up here and a sprig here, nothing in the middle. It'll fill in, but you got to be patient. So, um, all parts at work, um, above the ground, um, wildlife benefit, coverage for soil, you get stiff grass, a little bit. Um, erosion and runoff assistance. This is where. Your buffers, um, if you get into the engineering part of them, gets to be more intense. But the amount of slope you got determines the width of your buffer. So oh, if you got a lot of runoff, you need a lot of buffer in there in the grasses to catch and stuff. And that's where the different parts, and that's where you can go into putting into different types of grasses, the switchgrass and, and stuff that's going to stand and hold up a lot. It's like a lot of resistance and moisture snow and then going on here and then it gives you some good wildlife benefit uh, also give you some coverage for the soil and the stiff grasses mainly the warm season wheat grasses will stand the cool season and then after that big blue side oats um switch grass and those indian grass those types will give you a lot more stiffness catch the snow hold things in place and then the erosion and runoff assistance it slows things down and you can kind of take it, take a, do this at home. You can take a glass of water, just pour it on your tabletop, do it outside, but pour it on the tabletop, the water just poof, it's off the table. Well, then take a roll of paper towels and make a dam around it, put it down and pour it on there, and it runs up against it, and catches it. Then add more water. Well, it'll slow some of it down, but some seeps through. That's just what a natural buffer does or a buffer that's put around on the water, the rivers and the lakes. You got to keep that. The fields, we don't see too many of them around here anymore, but fence lines, they used to have grasses growing in them. That was a perfect buffer because just like the top of the table, just like figure it out as the top of the field. If you don't have anything to stop it when it hits the edge, it just keeps going. And where does it end up? Ends up in our water supply, ends up in the creek, ends up in the aquifer. Somewhere along the line down the road, we got to deal with it from one perspective. Um, below, below the ground, you can get erosion control. Um, the roots will go deep and uh, better, deeper to go and better to hold. Um, get good ground infiltration of the water. When it rains or on snow runoff, increased filtration, slows contact with groundwater and can filter the groundwater. And here's a Example here of some roots growing deep on this plant. This plant not so, so you can just common sense will tell you this should have more infiltration and better soil holding capability. So the next slide, here's the root systems of prairie plants. And this is in one foot increments on the either side and one foot going above. So over here is uh Kentucky bluegrass, and you can see <laughs> it's you mow it, you mow it two inches, you're only gonna have two inches of roots. And and that's I wish a week ago we did a dormant seed for a guy and we did a tile spade. And I wish we would have saved that because we went down about 12 inches 
his pasture was about two inches tall, a little bit taller than the carpet, and his root mass on the bottom was about the same. So he had about eight inches of nice black soil that had nothing in it. The roots, the, nothing like this, they were like this. And he pastured it, and we've got him into a program now. Well, he's in the S4M with us through the Big Soup Project. But he's not going to pasture it next year, and then he's going to incremental graze it and harvest it. And he knows, we showed him, he knows. But a lot of the pastures, if you go and drive around the creek banks, if you don't see a lot of grass on them, there isn't much hold in the soil there. And it'll just keep sloughing into the, sloughing down, sloughing down. But, but these other ones, you can see, there's not as much there, two feet above the ground, but 14 feet. That's a lead plant. And we plant quite a bit of that seed in some native mixes. Um, the thing with that is it can come up the first year, but it takes like five years to get that depth. But, and then there, and some of the other ones, this is a compass plant. And I'm trying to think here, big blue stem, this one here, get about six, seven feet above the ground, about eight to nine under the ground. So over here, this is buffalo grass. Buffalo grass is used in some yards and in some neighborhoods. Problem that people don't understand what that is, is that if you plant buffalo grass, it'll start greening up on Memorial Day, it'll start browning up on Labor Day. So if you want to have green grass with your neighbor, you don't want to plant that, you can plant that, because that will green up in April. But in the middle of summer, when you're dumping a lot of water on it, on that to keep it green, this will stay green with no water. And then it'll grow about four to six inches. And you can mow it and it rhizomes, it repeats from the roots and from seeds. So you can maintain that, but you still have a green, green yard, but it'll go by Labor Day, it'll be brown, like green and so So anyway, so those are just, you know, this one here, side oats. You know, again, it's good ground cover good cover for wildlife, but you know, you're talking seven, eight feet of roots on there, switch grass. And you guys probably all heard of these and stuff, but it's just, they're in the mix and everything. So, and we can, you can get those. The city, um, we plant a seven way mix down on the flats down there towards the big Sioux. And I think there's four of these in there on a big, Big blue, little blue side oats, blue grama, and I think switchgrass. And then there's wheatgrass, two wheatgrasses. So, and what they're doing there is they're taking ground that's being rented to producers right now and they're slowly taking it out of production. It's over the big aquifer from Ditch Road towards the river. Then they're taking the makers and turning them into native perch, native grasses. Establish that for better water quality, low soil control. And uh, less less competition on the ground. So this happens here to a plant. If you harvest fifty percent of its top, you'll have that much growing underneath the ground. So if you're mowing it, pasturing it, cutting it for hay, you can reduce your your rootage, and you're under the ground, and your top growth to slow the water down. And over here. If you do 70%, you're gonna lose more roots and roots and keep it going. And then after 17 days, it stops growing on there. And if you take 90%, you take it like this carpet down there, 90% and you can see the difference in the root mass. So then when it rains, you have less foliage on top to hold the moisture in, pull it in, and you have less here to make good infiltration into the ground. So it's a double-edged sword. So going into buffer areas, there are linear native vegetation patch planted near a waterway that is used to address resource concerns. And sometimes it's to split a field up, sometimes it's to look at tributaries and uh, that kind of stuff. And basically in town, you have green corridors, you can consider them buffers and things like that. So riparian areas, especially along small and narrow flow streams, if you put a buffer and have some riparian, some trees in there, and you can really get a nice 
nice buffer to slow everything down, get that water to clean itself out, go through the soil, go through the grass, and uh, everything on there. And the pollution, it'll get caught in the, the chemicals and stuff will get caught in the stems and uh, back into the roots and they infiltrate and slowly percolate through the soil. And there again, you know, you look at it and you think about it, it's common sense that if you have nothing there to stop it, it's just going to keep running. And where does it go? It goes to the road ditch, goes to the river, goes to the city sewer, goes to the water runoff, storm sewer, whatever. Then we have to deal with it in the other stuff. So the better thing is, is try to clean it up upstream of where you have to clean it. And that's part of the big Sioux project, part of everything we do in Minot County. We try to promote for wildlife and in that part. And the city's doing Big job on that plus the big two project is getting people involved in the buffer. And you don't want to make it mandatory, but someday it might be. Hopefully not, but politically wise it might get driven to that. So uh any primary benefits of them, you get erosion, reduction, pollution, and increased soil quality and stabilization. So and this like a bank like this, there was a bank out on Stump Creek that we looked at a week or 10 days ago. That was about 125 feet up. And it was, so it'd be about three times that, so it'd be up there. And the top had grass on it, but the grass was, again, no roots going down, and it was just like a ball knob. So, you know, those things, it's tough to get them back, but you can, you can work on it. And erosion reduction, vegetation, wind, water, surface erosion, um, slows the water. Provides good ground cover, uh, root systems, hold, um, riparian areas of high concern for erosion. So you don't see too many riparians anymore in this area because the farm use and the use of the land has changed a lot. But uh, if you can get a buffer and then it's a patch of trees to grow beside it, you can really, really create a good buffer to slow the grass down, slow, slow the water down, catch it, clean it. Get it into the grass, let it filter before it gets into the aquifer and into the water. So. And the pollution removal, reduction, um, vegetation, um, slow to runoff, it increases the filtration um, deposits, um, nutrient uptake, uh, pollutants are collected from the surface runoff and also in the ground. <clears throat> and the thing that we're finding now is. Stuff they said 30 years ago, 40 years ago was safe. It's still hanging around. Um, they're finding the chemicals and I know there's all kinds of different ones, but atrazine is a big one that we run into. And it, and it clings to the soil and hangs on and, and uh, you know, it's just not good. So gotta be aware of that stuff too. Um, and the other thing is the grasses and stuff on the trees, grasses especially, aren't cheap. You know, you can buy a figure 100 and, $150 an acre for just a basic native grass stand or seed that you buy. So you're going to stick on 10 acres, you'll probably stick $1,500, $2,000 into it, plus seeding and plus your maintenance. So if you're going to go to all that work, you got to make sure you got got it in the right right position and things to do and watch the chemicals that have been used before. Just a lot of things to think about. The sediment. Dissolved pollutants, dissolved nutrients, pesticide solvents, uh, nitrates, phosphorus, and uh, then buffers can do filtration before the water gets into the stream. Can help that a lot. That's the main purpose of the big soup project is to clean it up before it gets back into the water into the water system. So, so anyway, anybody got any questions? Okay. So. Here's a here's uh, look on this, the nitrogen removal. Um, you can take it up through plant uptake, or you can do it through the soil going down through um, more organic matter that you have present in your soil, more it's broken up, and roots and stuff in there, the better saturation, um, the more permeable the soil is, rain can do all that, proper pH is maintained, everything plays a part. Um, I think since I moved here, moved here from Wisconsin in 2004, and uh, I 
just amazing by how much farmland has turned into realty property and how much is covered with concrete and asphalt. And so many of the areas where it used to, and I, well, Brian Top and some of the guys I work with, they talk about 30 years ago, oh, there was a pond over here and there's a pond over there. And they're all gone because everything is, you know, but what you got to remember is, is that if those are gone, then that water, where it comes from, has nowhere to go. So then it stays in the street, stays in the water tunnel. So all this stuff gets moved a lot quicker now than it did when there were spots for it to slow down, let it filter, and then move on. So, and the thing is, urban sprawl, we're not going to change it. We just have to make better areas for it to stop, get caught in the grasses, the buffers, the trees, let them do their natural filtration, the cattails and whatever. Let them do all this and take all this stuff out before it goes into the aquifer or out into the stream and moves on. To so phosphorus remo removal, um, that's probably the biggest one that we hear around here. Um, some of the lakes and stuff, it's the algae blooms, the phosphorus pop up June, July and make lakes inhabitable and can't believe the fish really do too well either, but um, people are still trying to use it by the time I'm there. So and here's what I was talking about earlier. That if you're in a buffer, and it's by hard to read secret back there, but uh, you want to leave enough vegetative cover to have some ground cover, but then you want some young trees and bushes and stuff growing, and then have your older ones to protect it a little bit too, but keep cycling them through, trim them up, keep them clean, and uh, they'll they'll do more for you than if you just let them grow and go wild. And if you travel in the Northeast at all, I was out there two falls ago, and they have a lot of ground that's laying idle. But now they're running into the problem is it's been idle too long, and it's getting overtaken with weeds, thistles, noxious stuff that they don't want there. And so now they're having little fights and tussles in the communities, what they're going to do. Well, some people want to put cattle back on them, they, some don't. So it's just, you, get, you have to use the land is what I'm getting to. You have to maintain it, you have to use it and do something with it. You just can't plan it, let it go, or let it go because sooner or later it will plug itself up. So you got to keep some stuff clean. Used to be a lot of fires and stuff out this way, naturally, and that's kind of slowed down things. So an increased soil quality and stabilization, increased filtration of the soil through the slow runoff, and plus you got increased vegetation, makes your nutrients in your soil better. Um, the roots go further into the soil and saturate it, and also make it more permeable for waters and nutrients, plus chemicals and stuff to go in, but then they get filtrated out. So um, the organic matter, seasonal coverage, vegetation assisted moisture retention. So you have all that kind of op opportunities with that, those items. And you have to see location, select areas with the water sources, um, improve water quality, consider your water flow, riparian buffers may need additional considerations, and your width. And this little map, this little map over here, Kind of depicts here, you got your streams and your runoff and your buffers, all they should be in place to help make that stream as clean as possible. And I know land uses dictate what gets done in them, but and most everybody in probably is in here is in somewhat animated areas, but how many people have you seen that buy 10 acres, put a house and shed up, and then they just clear cut everything because they want to clean it up? Well, that's okay if you put some more vegetation back, but a lot of them they don't. So then it's a clean shot for everything to move on you. So, you know, buffers and riparian stuff are you know, the steepness of the slope dictates the width of your uh, of your buffer. And uh, the wider you go, um, the steeper it is, the wider you go, because it's just like a funnel. You bring it all down. You got to go wider to make it work. In your adjacent land use, your vegetation, weather, frozen soils, um, snow, 
And then when that melts, if you have things in here, frozen ground, limited in infiltration. Um, trees, not much grass. It's probably just going to shoot through. You probably won't get much benefit out of that. But here, you got root reinforcement on the bank, plus some tall grass and stuff. Again. <laughs> Must be telling me I'm done. <laughs> so, if you need to get got any questions or whatever, we can ask here at the end. But, Minneapolis Conservation District, that's our website. Big Soup Project's got theirs. NRCS, that handout is an NRCS handout. If you didn't get one, we've got two left. Um, then you can, you can get a lot of information there, and I'll lead you into other things there. So. And those are all the list of places where all the information came from. That's it. All right, we'll go ahead and get going. Our next speaker is Barry Berg. Barry grew up in southeastern Minnesota in a small rural farm community. He attended Mankato State University and South Dakota State University, studying biology and wildlife. He's currently employed by East Dakota Water Development District with 15 years of experience working on the Big Sioux River Watershed Implementation Project as the Watershed Coordinator. Barry's going to talk about segment four of the Big Sioux River Project. Thank you, Josh. Um, yeah, and, and on that biography, I mean, I, I have 15 years working on the implementation project, and today I figured I would walk you guys through a little bit of history of the Big Sioux Project. And kind of start out where I started with it, which has been longer than 15 years. I hate to date myself, but uh, we'll uh, we'll look at that, and then we'll look at some things that that we've completed in segment four, and uh, kind of where we are today. So, okay, just a few project sponsors and partners on this slide: East Dakota Department of Ag. Uh, well, it's Danner now, Department of Bank and Natural Resources, City of Sioux Falls, City of Del Rapids. I'm not going to list them all off, but just appreciating all the sponsors and, and the funding that they provide for the Marshall Project to the world. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to go over a little bit of project history, our segment four accomplishments, and reductions in success of offers. With reductions that we've realized in in uh, two segments of of the watershed project. Uh, this photo in the background here, this is actually a photo of Brant Lake, by the way, and that is Skunk Creek this last summer coming out of Brant Lake. Um, simple point, Robert. Yeah, the middle middle button there. Yeah. Okay, so this water control structure right here. The water from from the lake to that water control structure, and then I don't know if anybody's familiar with the upper reach of Stone Creek, but right in this area here is a pump fall from the, the Wentworth ethanol plant. So that's where they discharge into Stone Creek, and that was the only water. And I can't zoom in on this, but when I was flying the drone, I flew over that that pool that was below that, and they have metal bars and stuff to keep the the carp and the rough fish from running up in the lake. That thing was full of carp. I mean, there were just gigantic carp in there trying to get through there, but nothing on the other side, so we couldn't get it through there. So, but I thought that was pretty neat. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the beginning of the watershed projects. Actually, I started before this. I started out in roughly 1998, working on the original assessments of the watershed, and started out with Brookings Conservation District right, in cooperation with the District of the Water Development District and basically ran all the way through the Big Sioux River watershed, the central Big Sioux River watershed, which starts roughly uh, Esteline, all that area, and then goes all the way down to Sioux City. So I started out doing what we call ground truthing and Basically, did an inventory of different land use, pastures, feedlots, things like that in the watershed. And I was a GIS mapper back then. Is that for some of my grad 
work that I did at SCSU. And so I started a art map program where I could take all of the points and all the different areas that I had documented through the ground here thing. And I put an art map project together of, of where certain feedlots were, uh, grazing where that was taking place, and then fields and things like that. And so we came up with a big GIS database so that this was the assessment phase of the project. We were ramping up to know where things kind of were, know what, what issues we had or, or what the scope or the size of the, of the stuff we had going on in the watershed so that when we started implementation, that we had a better idea of what we needed to do to reduce the, the uh, amount of pollution that was affecting the watershed, which Back then, the environments and they still are were bacteria and those suspended solids. So, anyways, that was from 1998 to about 2002 that I worked on doing all the assessments. And believe me, I drove every single gravel road, every dead end road <laughs> in that entire area up there. And I spoke to, I think, about 1,400 producers. And interviewed them on their their operations, but, and uh, yeah, it was it was quite a deal. We got quite a bit of information down. After that, um, then I went up to the north central watershed, the watershed above this, and completed assessments up there, and then got hired on through SDACD, the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts, in two thousand three, to work on the implementation. It was a 303D planning project where we went out work with producers to get them interested in doing stuff to reduce sediment and reduce E. coli in the system and work with producers to do agway systems to contain the uh, buffer strips, filter strips, you name it, and kind of ramped up for this project, which was the first segment of the Mixed River project that East Dakota Water Development District was a sponsor of. And this project started in 2005, so we were ramped up to do stuff. And on here, you can kind of see I pulled out of our tracking system. This is DNR's tracker page where all the stuff is entered in, all the dollars that are put in, what gets spent, and what practices. So we can tease out some of the practices. It's not a list of all the practices that were done, but it's the main ones egg waste systems, grazing systems, riparian area protection, and this. Riparian area protection are like the filter strips, buffer strips, things like that. These will change as I go through these slides, but I kind of want to give you an idea of what happened throughout the years on the project and, and how it's transformed into now. But this was 2005 to 2010, and you can see the practices. This is Sioux Falls right here. So most of the practices were upstream of Sioux Falls, and there were a few up in the north central portion of the watershed that were done, because that was the area that was. Uh, the project was keying on back then. Okay, and after I did the 303D planning to ramp up for that first segment, I didn't personally work on that first segment. I kind of shipped down to the lower portion of the watershed project, and Lincoln Conservation District was the lead sponsor for that project. So, 2008, after I finished up with the planning, I moved down to the lower, lower end of the watershed, and I was a lone soldier working in Union and Lincoln counties, doing conservation work, working with agway systems, conservation tillage, grass waterways, riparian restoration. And this was a two year segment. Prior one was a five year segment. This was only two years. So, started getting a few things done down in this area. Uh, terracing, that was another big practice as you could drive down into Lust Hills and the lower end of the watershed, you see a lot of terraces. A lot of steep landforms. So those terraces are a big practice and it, it's something that's needed down in that area. So okay, then we moved into segment two. I moved into segment two of the lower big Sioux that went from 2010 to 2012. And a few more practices down there. Uh agway system, grass waterways, grazing systems. I didn't list the terraces on here. That's just some things that I didn't pull up to put on there, but there's a few of them on there. Anyways, 2010 to 2012, Central Big Sioux River Project segment one was ending in 2010. And 
wasn't really a sponsor that was willing to grab onto the next segment of it, segment two. So there was talk about, you know, what should we do? I kind of got wrapped up in some of those conversations and ended up going into it. They went into an interim project for the Big Sioux, and I took on the interim, which was just a kind of bridge from segment one into segment two. And while I was working on the lower Big Sioux, Every two years, I was doing a final report. Every year, I was doing a final report, or I was doing a, a new report, or they call it a project implementation proposal for the next phase. So either year, I was doing reports and reports, and then I was helping up in the in the uh, central doing reports up there. Kind of got tired of writing reports, reports, reports all year long, and compiling all the data, and it was taking up all my time. So I said, why can't we go back to uh, a five-year project? And how about this? We combine the lower that I'm working in with the central and make it one project. And so at the time, DE and R, now it's Danner, bought in to that idea. And so we combined the central and the lower, and we found a sponsor, which was Moody County. So they took over sponsorship of that project. That was the big merge. and. From that time on, everything started to click. Um, it was a lot better as far as logistically, you know, the final reports that need to be generated and the stuff being done, they were easier to handle in that type of period. And it was a big area, um, but we got a couple of people working on it at the time. So that, that kind of helped out. But when that got combined, we started doing more Agway system cropland BMPs. Harris's filter strips, things like that. Riparian restoration protection. This is Skunk Creek right here. Comes in, there are Sioux Falls, but this tributary of Skunk Creek, you start seeing these red ones, which are the riparian restoration protection. Within that second segment from Fixed Project, that's when the SRAM program came about. That's when I, I started developing it in 2012. 2013, we rolled it out and I finished getting all the contract work and everything in place. But those red dots are SRAM and RAM projects on Skull Creek. And if you're not familiar with those, maybe I'll let's come to some of that I'll do a specific talk on that. But basically their SRAM and RAM are buffer programs. They keep the cattle out of the stream during the summer months, but you can hang it. And if they hang it, so you're using the vegetation, you're getting use out of it. Then after September 30th, past the recreational period, you can go in there and do a fall grazing and actually graze it. But you have to have an alternative water source available. So that pulls the, the livestock away from eating around in the street and doing their business. So I'll give you that. That's just a quick overview of what the SRAM program is. But it's been very successful in reducing the E. coli. And it has some effect on the sediment, not as much as the E. coli, though. In the in the water in Skull Creek, so we've had really good success with it. Um, that's segment two, like I said. Here's segment three from 2015 to 2020. Moody County was still the sponsor of this, and again, now you're seeing our Agway systems, the black ones. They're kind of popping up. Um, these are the main tributaries in blue around the watershed. They're actually the impaired tributaries. Cropland BMPs are green, anywhere from, from terraces to filter strips, like I said. And then your red is the riparian restoration protection. So now a bunch more reds are popping up. Skunk Creek, Pigston River, some of these other tributaries. This is Pipestone Creek. Pipestone comes in Moody County in South Dakota and then jumps back out in Minnehaha County back into Minnesota. But there's a little arm of it up there, and then it comes back in through the uh, Split Rock Creek. So SRAM and RAM projects, we really started putting a lot of that stuff on the ground and being really proactive and pushing that. Our main focus, though, was the Skull Creek drainage. As you can see there, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Okay, so after segment three, we moved into what's now segment four just last year. Moody had been Moody County Conservation District had been sponsoring that that project for 10 years and they decided, you know, 
they had some changes in their in their chair of their board and, and they decided they didn't want to carry it anymore that it might be one of the other districts responsibility or give a chance to another district and so many uh, conservation districts picked up the, the sponsorship of the project which started in 2020. so now they're the the lead sponsor and we're continuing with that we've only had just just over a year three months of working on segment four and you can see we've got riparian buffers, grazing systems now that we've implemented um, on Skunk Creek, Mix River. We've got some showing up here on West West Pipestone on Pipestone, but we're we're pushing that stuff some more, doing some more buffers, um, getting good results as far as reductions in the water quality data. Um, so that's where we are today is in in our the beginnings of segment four and like i said it's a five-year segment we've got roughly right now we've got it scheduled out three years we've got to go in next year for funding for the last two years of the five-year segment but we're looking at anywhere from 15 to 20 million dollars of not just hard cash but city of sioux falls dollars del rapids city of del rapids three nine million dollars east dakota money and then what we call in kind match for producers. If we're cost sharing practices, we cost share typically 50% to 75% of the producer picks up the other portion of it. Agway systems could cost anywhere from a half million dollars to over 1.3 million. And if we can only pick up 30 to 50% of those, that producer is shelling out that much money too. So it's not really tough to get up to millions of dollars with with project expenditures and producer expenditures. So, and the final slide. Okay, so this is all of those projects together. And like I said, this isn't this isn't all the BMPs that we've installed in those years. This is just the main ones that we did. And some of these BMPs is just one point on the map. That point may be a point on the farm, and it might have three or four pastures associated with it. So it's not every every inch that, that conservation has been put on the ground, but it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, 16 years of, of implementation work, uh, what, what we've accomplished. So um, I think we've done a pretty good job and water quality, like I said, water quality results are starting to show some of that. So a little more in depth or detailed look at segment four BMPs just just in this year and three months that we've done. We've done two animal waste systems. We, our goal in the five year project is 10. And RAM, we've got a goal of 300 acres. We've done 64, 2.6 miles. SRAM, we've got a goal of 2,000 acres. We've done 119 and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through all these, but there's just an idea of what what we're looking at for our, our goals for segment four. <clears throat> so our pollutant reductions, just from what we've accomplished in this year in three months, nitrogen, we've got a reduction of 4,589 pounds per year. And of that 1,277 pounds on Big Sioux River, 3,312 pounds per year are on Stone Creek. So that means that whatever we did, if we put a buffer in there, that whatever was occurring there each year, approximately from a, it's a computer program that kind of guesses how much runoff you're getting from an area, each year you're losing that many pounds of nitrogen. And so it, it's not just saying, oh, you've reduced it 4,589 4, pounds each year because now we put something in place that grass or whatever that has been that is now using it up and has stopped that from occurring each year. So you, you really got to think on that type of scale and when it starts adding up that way, you get pretty, pretty incredible numbers. So this is just one year. Phosphorus happened to be exactly a thousand pounds. Fixed River, 345 pounds. Stone Creek, 655 pounds per year. Um, Sediment 332 tons per year. You know, if you get a tandem, don't 
15 ton. You do the math, you got 20 dump truck loads that per year that would be dumping into the to Skunk Creek or Baxter River that you reduce. So, and bacteria on the bottom, a little bit. I mean, bacteria numbers, I, I hate putting numbers up there because when you start talking bacteria, they're on a lot of scale. They're colonies, um, they die off, they reproduce. And in a handful of water, you can have you know, literally millions. So the number gets so dang large, I never display them in numbers. Uh, only on my reports with the EPA do I put them in numbers because they know what, what numbers are, are what, so. Okay, so for our SRAM, Seasonal Recreation Area Management, and RAM, Recreation Area Management, we're approaching the century mark. We have enrolled 85.7 miles since 2013. Now, that's 85.7 miles on the right hand side of the street, and 85.7 miles on the left hand street, uh, of the street. Uh, it's not just one side counted and the other side counted, it's both sides all the way up. So if you double that number, that's how much stream bank that we have protected. So we're approaching that 100 miles. Uh, when I first started this, this was a pilot program that I developed and I threw it out to the DNR as an idea that it was beneficial for producers because they still had use out of the area and yet we got water quality benefits from it. Try this. I, didn't, I never dreamed that it would go this far and all of a sudden blow up and everybody, both sides thought, heck, this is a great idea. So I didn't think it would get this big, but uh, it has. So to date, I went through and crunched some numbers and the funding that we have, 319, and then the SRF non point source funding that's generated through the clean water, water quality fund through DNR, through loans that the city of Del Rapids and the city of Sioux Falls take out to do sewer, sewage uh, treatment, sewer pipes, things like that. Um, and town doesn't experience, or the, the municipality doesn't experience any. Um, any additional interest or any payment that's additional. They just mess with the interest rate and it generates funds for the project to do the water quality work, basically. So those were the funds that were used. 319, City of Del Rapids, City of Sioux Falls. This was a total spent on that 85.7 miles. So just shy of $3 million. And when you break it down, that's $6.56 a foot. That's two sides. So on one side, you break that down again, it's three dollars and twenty is it fifty-six, three dollars and twenty-eight cents a foot. You can't stabilize or or do any type of, of soft protection on stream banks um, or anywhere near that, that cost. There, there's been some riprap projects done, and I'll tell you the riprap projects that have been done on the Big Sioux River started back in 2009. Back then it was about $88 a foot. And now, <laughs> uh, adding the fish ball, fish habitat and everything else, you're probably gonna be up to three, four, five hundred dollars a foot. So it's gone crazy. So what I was trying to show with this is it's very inexpensive to take this and not do anything to it. Not even take a planter out there. Don't let it plant the grass, just let it rest. Let it be for a while, let it seed itself, and then it works. Um, it's just a lot of pressure when this, this is going on all year long, that grass doesn't have any time to come back. There's no wood structure, there's nothing there. So that's the name of the game. It's, it's very inexpensive process. The more and more that we get introduced to doing this, and actually get educated about, you know, you can make this system work. You can do SRAM. You can raise cattle. You can raise a profit. You can make a profit on this land without having to say, I can't go graze it because you can. So it's it's working both ways, and, and I want to continue to push that out there. And this is the way I can I can do that. Um, 
I think Alexis talked to Zach and Mike. Yeah, and so our project specialist will be talking after I'm done here. And she's going to show the website and you know, how we're trying to get the information out there to the public for more education. Not only producers that are looking to get into our programs and stuff, but also the general public on, you know, this this isn't a I live here and I'm an urban person and, and you live out there and I don't pollute, you're the polluters and the finger pointing. You know, we're all in this together. Um, when Mayor Huther was here, you know, his big thing was I'm a polluter too. Everybody is. But it's it's got to be working together to at the common goal of, of better water quality. So we've got to stick with it and, and come up with new things. And that's that's what we're trying to do with the website and, and open up and take down those walls and make sure it's more transparent and everybody can see what's going on. So so anyways, with that, what do you have any questions? Did you find your SRAMs and be beneficial? With your E. coli load, I believe that's coming from the grazing livestock, or is there from like manure application on crop fields or, or both? Yeah, and actually, we didn't put a study together to, to study per se if there was land applied manure and grazing and, and the difference between the two. Um, it basically that that was taken out of the equation. It was Take the water quality sample at the bridge below whatever land that was enrolled in the program and <laughs> prior to putting SRAM in to after. And so what if and in and, and in all those areas besides the pasture, there's land applied that are going on. It's it's a hard thing unless you're going to interviewing everybody, but it's going on and it's it's beneficial for, for dropping and stuff. But we just didn't capture that, but we know it's there. And once the buffer was installed, it didn't matter. Crashed the E. coli numbers. I think the majority of it is the actual grazing, the in-stream, in-stream, in-stream direct deposit yeah. of, of E. coli. It is what it is. You're standing there and you're grabbing right your water source. At least a lot of times they would face upstream and crap as they're drinking. So <laughs> some did, but, but yeah, I think that answers your question. Yeah. What's the 319 funds? 319 are federal funds given to the states and they're given to Department of Environment or Department of A Natural Resources. They're federal 319 designed for specifically for projects like this for water quality and that type of stuff so the state basically has an annual meeting where you can come and, and send in or apply for those funds with a PIP project implementation proposal they review the proposals they decide you know you got a budget in there they've got a pool of money that comes in each year they decide how to break it out amongst all the people that come and ask for the funding. And once they break it out, they just can use that those dollars on specific things that are geared towards water quality. So you're in you're just starting year two, would you have to rewrite the MRCPP in five years? I actually wrote the PIP for the five years yeah. and I drew the budget out for five years, but then kind of like put the stop at three years and shelved the other part of it. So we sent in the three years. So now this next summer, I'm going to have to, and it, it's a year lag too. So you send in your, your proposals to DNR a year ahead, then you wait a whole year to fire. <laughs> so this next year, I will have to send the rest of the PIP in to get the water over the last two years. But I understand that each situation is different when we try to understand about the reduction. Right? Is there a you know, cast bag in the box that is not going to be position put in place? I, I... Yeah, and you know, 
you've got software that has a suite of BMPs that are programmed into the software. And so you take the software, you put in the distance from the water body that you're, you're trying to treat. You put in the circumstances that were existing, what you're doing as a change, if you're putting in a 30 foot buffer, if you're putting in terraces, if you're putting in the you know, whatever BMP you're putting in, you run it through that process, through that software, it spits out, okay, here's your reduction. Um, there are things that, that give you a better, higher reduction. I don't necessarily, you know, we really haven't put a pencil to paper to see exactly down to the dollar, which is better. I just know from a, going back a slide, from rip wrapping, you know, being way over $100 a foot, that just doing it naturally is, is a lot cheaper. Egg waste systems, they cost a lot of money, but if you have a feedlot situated next to a stream and no waste storage, and you might have a, a creek going close to that, the, the paddocks or the lots, which you get a rainstorm, carries a lot of uh, organic matter, a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus into the water, readily into the water, and you spend $100,000, well, how much is going in there every year? And how much did that $100,000 actually, you know, clean up? You can run it through the software and it'll, it'll spit you out a reduction. And that's where we get giant reductions, of course. We spend giant amounts of money as well to pay for it. So I really haven't gotten into that much detail. And it's because I'm, I'm doing this or I'm, I'm talking to guys, I'm trying to get them interested in the next SRAM or the next project. So. But you show up and take a look at it. It's it's apparent to what it's from doing it for twenty plus years. Kind of walk on site and go, yep, and then the, start the conversation. And it, it's pretty easy to tell what you know. Some things are out of place and what what needs to be done. Some some are difficult. I mean, it's like yeah, this is happening, but. How the hell do we do that? You know, we put a tree there and this is going to happen. And if we do this, this is going to happen. And so some are, are less obvious than others, but we're doing it long enough. It's it's pretty easy to understand. Is it difficult to get approval on board? It just depends. Um, you know, a lot of times somebody's been doing something for a number of years and that's just the way it's been done their their parents did it that way they're doing it that way if i came and told you that you're washing your dishes the wrong way you should do them this way you know are you gonna listen to me so there's there's a fair share that it, they're tough to change the management but you know education and and when i part of my job is to research stuff university studies and love doing that and finding new things that guys are doing and, and coming out to their place. If I talk to somebody, I ain't doing that. That's, I'm just going to end up blowing a bunch of money and what you do, break me, you know, and make sure it's actually a big profit. And so just education and, and persistence. But yeah, I would say, you know, 50% are pretty, Pretty eager and willing to work. The other fifty, you got to invest a lot of time. Um, and there's ten percent probably that are just, I'm doing it this way, and this is the way I'm doing. All right. Next up, we got Alexa Cruz. She is the watershed project specialist for the Big Sioux River project. She joined the project in the summer of 2020, and has since worked to develop its public presence. She aims to share the project's methods and successes with all those who live and recreate in the watershed. So, Alexa, take it away. Awesome. Thanks. Are we able to close this out so it's not in there? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, as you said, I am Alexa and I'm with the Big Sur River Project. And maybe you've heard of us, maybe you haven't, and maybe today you just heard about us if you um, listen in on uh, Barry's talk. That might have been your first time hearing about us, um, but at the end of this presentation, I hope you'll have a pretty good idea of what it is we do in the watershed um, and where we're headed with our project. All right, so what is the Big Sioux River 
project. We are water quality. Um, I'm giving this brief overview for those of you who aren't sure, uh, aren't familiar with our work, but the Big Sioux River project, we're just leading the way to improve water quality, not just in the Big Sioux River, but the entire Big Sioux River watershed. So obviously a river is not a singular system disconnected from everything else. We have a lot of tributaries, streams, creeks, that sort of thing. And we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we only focus on the Big Sioux River. A lot of our tributaries are also uh, impaired and have a lot of pollutants. And if we don't get those cleaned up, we're never going to get the Big Sioux River cleaned up. So we are uh, focusing on those as well, especially uh, Skunk Creek, as that uh, is a tributary into um, the Big Sioux River right before Sioux Falls, which, as you can imagine, is a pretty big focus of our project. Um, the Big Sioux River Project is a non-government, quasi-government entity. Uh, we are technically employed by the East Dakota Water Development District and the Minnehaha Conservation District. Uh, so if you heard John Parker speak earlier, he's the um, he's with the Conservation District. Uh, they are our sponsors for this project, um, for this segment of the project. And what we do is we implement best management practices, typically on agricultural land, like I said, uh, right next to the Big Sioux River or its tributaries um, to in improve water quality. So, for example, we have some best management practices related to, uh, to livestock. Um, we've got waste storage facilities. We, uh, we do uh, animal waste management systems to keep like animal waste contained, uh, not entering waterways, not running off feedlots. Uh, we are um, improving, uh, like we're improving water quality through reducing fecal and E. coli bacteria in that case, and also sediment inputs into waterways. Uh, cattle on uh, stream banks and things can definitely be detrimental to the banks and be, uh, you know, stirring up the water and inputting that sediment. And so that's another uh, best management practice that we work with is that sort of grazing management. Um, we provide financial and technical assistance to producers and uh, like non-operating landowners to implement these uh, practices. Obviously it's like incentivized. Um, other cropland management practices that we offer assistance with are filter strips, grass waterways, and um, terraces. We also do, uh, one of our biggest things is our riparian area protection through riparian buffers. Um, we've got the seasonal riparian area management and riparian area management programs, SRAM and RAM, and we have 85.7 miles in enrolled to date. You can see some of our, um, like the in red is where uh, those SRAM and RAM are located. So we're very proud of that um, sort of protection that we're offering because we feel like a lot of times people are like, what is actually being done about the water quality in the big Sioux? It's like, it's here, we're, we're doing it. We're just not super vocal about it. And that's one of the reasons I was hired to um, help, you know, increase our like public presence, public awareness of the water quality issues. Let's see, um, in 2020, we entered into uh, segment four of our project, um, which is this segment is going to last five years and our projected budget is about $14 million. Um, we get that through the EPA, the state's uh, revolving fund for non non point source pollution um, and local in kind uh, cost sharing match. Um, and we are continuing in this uh, segment until 25, 2025 and we're implementing best management practices as usual. We're, we've also introduced just in this last year, a working lands easement program. So it's a perpetual easement that you enter into an agreement with us. And our uh, sort of holder for that contract is Northern Prairies Land Trust, and we work with them and it will be for water quality forever. So it's pretty cool. And also now we're placing this emphasis, like I said, on uh, community engagement and our you know sort of public awareness campaign. Um, before I get too much further, I just want to thank. Uh, I just want to thank our project partners. We have the East Dakota Water Development District, which provides staff and some funding, and they also do water quality uh, testing all the time. And that's how we know that our projects are working. Uh, the Department of Ag and Natural Resources, um, again, more financial and technical assistance. City of Sioux Falls, financial, City of Del Rapids, also financial. NRCS, um, we do a lot of 
uh, collaboration with them and the Minnehaha uh, Conservation District and other local conservation districts are our sponsors and we do in kind match with them. We've had Moody County and Lincoln County um, be our uh, sponsors in the past. So just so that we have another level of like checks and balances as we're spending, you know, this money on these practices. And then, like I said, when we're land trusts. And expanding our reach. Oh, one more thing, actually, uh, if you're confused about our relationships with all our partners, we do have a handy infographic on our website, bigstreetriver.com, that shows our relationships to all of our different partners. So, anyway, as we get into it, who knows about the Big Sioux River Project? In order to expand our reach, we are making these moves to become a more familiar, you know, hopeful household name, especially in the Sioux Falls area, but throughout the entire watershed, really. Um, we have established a uh, presence within the conservation sort of community. We uh, like our project that projects that this point are selling themselves. Uh, farmers, you know, have coffee shop talk and they talk about us and we have more work than really we can even handle right now and are looking at getting more employees. Um, but we aren't super well known within just like the general uh, public sort of community. So how do we get the word out to all of our stakeholders in the river? So I was just hired on last year. One of my big things was supposed to be our, you know, our, our branding and making us have a consistent image. So as you can see here, we have some of our branding, um, Big Sioux River Project. Hopefully that becomes a more recognizable uh, symbol and logo for people. Um, we've got BigSiouxRiver.com. Uh, you can do any varieties of .net, .org, that sort of thing, and that'll come up too, as well as Big Sioux River Project. Dot com. Um, this is this is important for us, especially because now for producers, we can say, hey, if you want to sign up for this practice or apply, here's where you can go on our website and you can fill out that form, do that application, send it in, and it's a much faster process than it was uh, before when we were doing things by paper and snail mail. So there's that piece of it. Um, so we did our branding, we've got our, you know, our online presence, our website, that's uh, something I built over this, especially this spring. Um, we also have a presence on social media now. That's one of the ways, you know, it would be absolutely silly not to take advantage of the power that social media has. And so that was one of the things I was tasked to do is to get us a social media uh, presence. And so you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter at these different handles. Um, and our, you know, this is this group that we're targeting. Our followers are more likely, you know, community members, members of the public, not necessarily uh, farmers and that sort of thing. So we're saying, like, you know, we share these different things that we're doing. So, like, on, so I have it set up so that we do share some things that are like what you as a member of the public can do on your own little yard or just in your house um, for water quality. Uh, we do that on Tuesdays. We have a tip. Today will actually be about the summit, though, since we have a bigger event going on. But we uh, might do something like, oh, pick up after your your dogs or here's when you should fertilize your lawn. Don't um, because that runs off into storm drains and pollutes the river, that sort of thing. Um, and then on Wednesdays, we share like a wildlife, like a member of the wildlife of the watershed. Uh, those are pretty popular and keep more interest. And then on Thursdays, we talk about our, like our projects and our programs and hopefully get the word out there just a little bit more like here's, you know, here's this riparian buffer we're working right on right now, or here's this plan we just finished for this animal, uh, like this egg waste barn, deep pit barn or something like that, right? Like we're sharing those now, hopefully with a, a slightly broader audience. Um, and Fridays, we just do a feature uh, of a spot in the watershed and I would love to make that more of an interactive thing in the future and get like submissions from other um, other stakeholders. Uh, let's see other sort of marketing that we've had. We've had our, you know, like I said, our website and our social media. Um, we also have the city of Sioux Falls is still running a radio campaign that, um, you know, it's, I think it's like $80,000. It's a pretty expensive like yearly thing that they do um but that just runs ads on just different things again that uh, the general public can do to improve water quality 
Um, we've also been in a handful of articles in this past year, um, just different announcements too. And we also have been working on um, recently, we had a $3 million grant uh, for the regional conservation. Oh, regional conservation practice program <laughs> partnership program. There it is. There's so many acronyms to remember. Um, we are sending out these cards to people to let them know, like, here's uh, you're in this priority watershed. Here's some of the practices that we are cross sharing right now. Um, so just different ways to sort of get that that information out there and get. Um, get more people involved. Uh, some of the events and tours we did this year, um, we had a Senate appropriations committee tour. Um, they just a bunch of senators came out and took a look at the watershed. They learned about water quality sampling and how that works off of this bridge here. That's just uh, by Del Rapids. And we showed them um, a piece of land that was not in seasonal riparian area management behind. And then on the other side, we have one of our beautiful um, buffers, uh, buffer programs. Uh, that was, I think, a good moment for a lot of those people to see, like, here's here's out in the field, here's where these dollars are going. Um, we had a legislator tour, which was quite a big group, actually. Um, I think there were about 40, 40 people there. And for a lot of these, uh, like, people, this was their first time, like, seeing a waste system like this, which I don't know if y'all grew up in the country or on a farm or anything like that but that's pretty crazy to me to be in south dakota and not have ever been to like an animal containment facility so um that was a pretty unique uh, moment for a lot of those people to connect with like their constituents like oh here's like a whole subset you know south dakota is so big on egg um to not have had that connection before was kind of a shame so we showed them one of the barns that we've uh, implemented as one of our best management pra um, practices. And this is actually a barn that's pretty near Wall Lake, if any of you are familiar with that. And so this runoff goes directly there, but not anymore because it's nicely contained in this uh, egg waste facility that we've implemented. Um, I also attended and went to the Dakota conference at Augustana University. It's pretty amazing to see, like, just like this sort of event, there's a lot of other people in the watershed who are doing things that are not, like, not necessarily ag-based, right? These these people are um, writing things about the history of the Big Sioux River, and they're, you know, making art and writing poetry and things like that. And that's just another way that um, the general, you know, public, you know, can connect with the watershed. Um, we also worked with friends of the Big Sioux River on the El Rio beer launch. Did anyone have that? Anyone have that beer? Yeah, I think it was pretty good, right? It was nice. Mexican lager is delicious. Um, and yeah, so we helped. Um, we talked with our parent group, East Dakota Water Development District. They gave the water right permits for the El Rio beer um, to collect that surface water. And filter that for beer making purposes. Um, and we're definitely looking to get involved with Friends of the Big Sioux and the Big Sioux River project more in the future. This was um, these two, we had two, they had two beer events, excuse me, in the last year. I can't remember what the first launch was called. Anyone, anyone else? No, I don't, I don't remember what the first beer was, but uh, it was like launched on Earth Day. Um, but we're hoping in the future to do uh, more of these and possibly like a beer tour of the entire watershed. Uh, just gets another group of people interested in the health of our water and, oh, it's drinkable? No, not really. Like there's a lot that has to be done to it before that can happen. So um, also Friends of the Big Stew River had a new, they launched their open house. They have a new office. So we were at that supporting them. Um, we did a tour with the Pipestone Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, this was largely to show about SRAM. So actually our programs are gaining quite a bit of traction here in the Midwest and our surrounding state neighbors are uh, hoping to implement some of these things. We are talking with um, people in Rock County, Iowa um, about doing some of these S like S our our riparian management systems like there um, in Minnesota, they've already secured funds to do basically our exact SRAM program over there. They don't have nearly the funding that we do, but 
um, it's a start because the watershed doesn't have a boundary. The river doesn't have a boundary, like a state line, like we do. It's so strange to parcel it out based on state lines. It really doesn't, you know, encompass the whole thing. We can only do work on our pieces of the watershed that are in South Dakota. Um, so it's awesome that we're able to get partners like this in Minnesota and Iowa to um, help the other parts of the river and the watershed that aren't, you know, within our boundaries. We also presented at, or like we were, we were present at Riverfest uh, for the first time. We had all of our sort of informational materials, uh, our sort of successes and our numbers and that sort of thing. And then also an interactive thing that kids really liked um, where you could put a sticker on where you are in the, in the watershed and we can get a map of where people are. Um, so it was pretty cool. And then just recently here, I uh, did a course for Ollie with the Friends of the Big Sioux River, uh, Friends of the Big Sioux Rivers, Travis Entenen. Um, we presented to, I think it was about 45 in person. And then online, there were like another 30 or so people who were listening in. Um, and we did an hour and a half course just about the history, um, the sort of this standing point, like where we are at with water quality and then sort of our, you know, the Big Sioux River projects and then the Friends of the Big Sioux Rivers different efforts uh, to improve water quality in the watershed. Um, in our future growth, I'm working on more content for the website, discovering the Big Sioux River, just kind of getting more in depth about um, sharing pieces of the river with some people that they've never seen before, say like doing video tours, of an animal waste system if you've never seen one of those or like going out into the field and having like live streams where we show our different um, buffer programs and that sort of thing. Uh, FAQs, I need to get up there yet. Um, and then in January, I have um, work that's starting with teachers. I've got quite a um, few teachers uh, secured, especially in the middle school, but a couple high school as well. Um, to come into their classrooms and do some water quality education. I feel like the, um, the younger generation is, you know, going to be our saving grace kind of thing. And so getting in with them and getting a good word in for water quality in the Big Sioux River early on is important. Uh, and it's good to have that hands on education from an outside um, perspective. That's not just their regular teacher. Um, I also, if you're into that kind of thing, look out this summer. We have a couple of local businesses that we're working with um, to do a bike scavenger hunt mm -hmm. and also to do cleanups via kayak with Sioux Falls Kayak Rentals. So keep an eye out for that if that's something you might be interested in. Um, and then we have some virtual events planned as well. And there's a lot to look forward to as we grow our reach, but thank you for listening. And at this time, if you have any questions or discussion, I would love to love to hear. It. So, yeah. Do you guys have any signage along some of the riparian zones? That is a great question. No, we don't. But it is something that we have talked about doing, especially as we do our working lands easements now, since that is perpetually in our care. We can more clearly say, oh, the sign is going to be here, you know indefinitely unless it gets damaged or something like that as opposed to a lot of our contracts that we enter into are um 10 or 15 years uh we do have however a few higher profile sites that are visible from like the interstate say like just north of um sioux falls right north of the water plant there we have uh like a mile of sram and we'd really like to get in like a billboard there um to say like look this is where your tax dollars are going. <laughs> we are, it's actually improving the water quality and we have measurable, you know, reductions to, to show that. So, yes, keep an eye out. Yeah, cheers. Thank you so much for listening to me yammer on about how we're changing our project and growing. And yeah, thank you so much. Cheers, you guys. <laughs>